Dr. Smodkas, thank you so much. How are you feeling a week after your announcement? Um, I'm feeling lighter than air. Uh, it's a great feeling to know that we've come so far in 10 years and that now it's time to pass the reins and let someone else with new vision and fresh leadership ideas and a lot of energy take the university to the next level. Speaking of taking the university to the next level, um, boy, did you do that over the last decade. What was your focus coming in? Well, uh, I don't know if you recall, I came in, we had some financial hardships and uh, we first had to settle our financial situation, but we formed a strategic plan that was solid. We said, we're gonna be tier one. We want to be a, a major force. We wanna, we wanna be a university people knew on a national level. We didn't wanna be the best kept secret anymore. And uh, we wanna be a place that's recruiting well and competing uh, for the students here in Texas so that we can make North Texas a great place and give employers a wonderful workforce. We stuck to our plan. We exceeded all of my expectations. I thought if we had 10 years and we could just be stable, everything good will happen, and, and it did. You, uh, one of the biggest, you're ranked a tier one research university by the Carnegie classification. Was that something you were striving for when you came here? Oh, very definitely. Uh, everybody wants to be tier one, top tier. And so we set a course for it. We called it tier one our way. Uh, and we knew that we'd be a little different because we weren't just a science and engineering school. We were a full, we are a full comprehensive uh, liberal arts program. We've got great social sciences, great humanities, great music. As you know, we just won seven more Grammys this time. Great art school. So we wanted to be tier one, but show you could do it, not just focusing on one area, but having a broad, strong base. Would you say we're still known as the School of Music? <clears throat> I would say that's a strong part of our reputation because after all, uh, after sports, what do you hear about and see the most? It's all of the music stars that have come through here. Marin Morris, Eli Young Band, Nora Jones, Pat Boone, and then of course, Meatloaf. I mean, we've got so many. How involved, and Meatloaf we know has passed on, but how involved are our famous alumni? Uh, they vary from infrequent to here and our best friends. So it's really fun that we can draw them back. Uh, there's a few folks I'd like to see more often. I think they'd help the university out. And I love it when they come here and they interact and sit in with our students who are prodigious. Uh, in fact, uh, we're going to have a superstar here in the not too distant future. So, uh, but if I, I can't tell you who it is yet. I know. That's not fair. I know, Give I know. us a hint. The initials would be LL. You got to work with that. Lyle Lovett? What? <laughs> I did not say that. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And what will he be doing? Sitting in with our one o'clock jazz band, teaching some master classes, and generally uh, appreciating the university because the majority of his band are UNT alum. UNT serves, I would gather, a majority of students from Texas. What is Texas doing right to prepare students for college? Wow, that's a really, <clears throat> that's a really potent question. Texas has a highly organized program of study for K-12. It was disrupted during COVID. Uh, COVID was tough. The learning loss in math and English is profound, not just here in Texas, but across the entire United States. And it's something we're having to struggle with and rectify. But I would say that our K-12 school districts have uh, great faculty, many of whom we provide, who are really dedicated to seeing our students do better. So I, I love the dedication of the teachers in the region in, in Texas. I love the education programs that are serving our public school districts. And I love that they're still focused on college-ready curricula. The Texas Education Agency and the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board work hand-in-hand -hand with each other. And do projects, for example, with us. We're helping students who can't pass the math uh, requirements. They're called TSI, incomplete. 
Uh, and we've got a phenomenal program there where we've actually found that as we put some freshly trained teachers who have tremendous pedagogical skills in with the students who had deficit math, that we can really boost the retention and graduation rates of those students. So our Teach North Texas program is doing a great job. And from my perspective, this is just the kind of thing we all need to attend to because we can wring our hands that COVID hurt learning. But when we get a student here, we own that student. We own their success. We own a path to graduation with them. And so we're going to go hand in hand. And caring is that attribute that I am most personally proud of this university demonstrating. That Teach North Texas program you mentioned, is that here on campus? It is. It's a strong program, and it produces teachers who are always exemplary, teachers that are likely to be retained for a long period of time, teachers who are tops in their disciplines. Now on the flip side, what is Texas doing wrong to prepare students? You know, I, I can't speak highly for our public schools. I, I always think we need to be paying our public school teachers more. They're heroes, and uh, they don't get appreciated at the level they should be. But I will tell you that in public higher education, there's been strong investment. And we know that our job is to make sure that we're training the students who come to live in Texas. That's why we're an HSI, a Hispanic serving institution, and a minority serving institution. And that's why we actually have a tremendous respect for what it means to be first generation or minority as part of the pillar of how we run this university. We want to make sure students are cared for. We want to make sure that they have the resources that they need, that we're affordable, and that we have career and professional development that really moves them ahead. And that's how we support the economy, but it's also how we support our lives, uh, the lives of our students, their transformation, and it's how we change family trees, not just individuals. HSI happened under your leadership here. What would you say is the greatest opportunity under HSI? So first you become Hispanic enrolling, and then you become Hispanic serving. What does it mean to be Hispanic serving? Uh, and what does it mean in the state of Texas? Uh, we want to make sure that students feel welcome, that their families feel welcome, that they know there's paths to success. And we also want to make sure, just as we do for our first generation students, that the career and professional development pieces are there so that students can choose from the wide array of future jobs that are going to be available. So that's one element of HSI. The other is that we are one of 22 Carnegie Tier 1 HSIs. We have a coalition. It's called the Hispanic Serving Research Universities. We are out actively right now working with the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy, uh, NSF, NIH, to try to see if we can scale our programs so that we can produce more STEM professionals who look like the students who we have here. Last year, UNT successfully fended off a lawsuit seeking to change a policy I, I believe was near and dear to you, charging in-state tuition rates to undocumented students. Um, that was a long battle. What did that mean to you? Well, first of all, hats off to general counsel and their team and the state. Uh, we finally won after a fairly arduous path. Uh, in monetary terms, we lost $7 million a, that year. In human terms, it was a way we were asked to charge all out-of-state students the same as we charged in-state undocumented students. And uh, so it was a pretty good deal for some out-of-state students for a while. But more importantly, it was an attack on people who've come here, invested their lives, been strong in our school districts two years or more graduating from a high school in Texas. And my opinion is they deserve a path up and that we are here to give them that path up. So it would have been a bad thing to see us revert and charge undocumented students full out-of-state tuition. What do you say to the critics? <sighs> that Texas 
is a minority majority state. That if employers are going to have the strong diverse workforce that they need, and if we're going to continue to build on the great population momentum that we've had, that we need to be able to accommodate all the students who are graduating from Texas high schools. Last year, uh, the legislators banned DEI in public colleges uh, and universities. They debated eliminating faculty tenure. Did, did these new changes and considerations affect you uh, stepping down as president? No, they weren't the reason for stepping down. Uh, are they inconvenient? Yes, certainly. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, we interview new faculty members and we hire up. So every fall we have a new crop. Uh, it's harder to recruit when your state doesn't back the same values that the faculty have. Uh, do I understand the politics behind it? Yes, I think I do. Uh, do I support them? I don't think it's in the best interest of the state. I'll leave it at that. Uh, I think if you want to recruit great educators and you want to attract top industries, that you have to recognize that when I go out and talk with major companies around here, uh, Liberty Mutual, American Airlines, uh, it doesn't matter. They are looking for a diverse workforce, a strong workforce that looks like the community that's around them. I hope that we can get to the place where we realize that our job is to go ahead and place these students and make the economy stronger so that we can all prosper. How are you mitigating that on campus? <clears throat> well, First, let me be clear, we follow the law. Uh, the law is the law and we have understood and interpreted it across our campus. The advantage we have going for us in a values-based culture is that the attributes that we have like caring apply to everybody. And again, you've heard I'm first generation. So when you hear me say we have 40% first generation students and we're minority majority, we're here to give everyone a leg up. And so by caring for all of our students in an inclusive atmosphere, we can do better than many of our competitors. And I think we do that, and I think we model it well. Have you seen a big concern from students once DEI uh, was stopped? <clears throat> yeah, I think our black and Hispanic students have expressed themselves. They've asked for meetings with us. Uh, I will also say that, um, I love our students because they have a kind of a pragmatic, let's go get it attitude. You know, it's funny. People wonder how has higher ed changed with all these rules and regulations. I will tell you that I talked to an alum who graduated 50 years ago and asked them why they came here and what happened with them. I talked to students who graduated last year. Their motives are the same. They want their lives changed. They want to pursue a career, the career of their dreams. They want to be successful and they want to build a good life for themselves. That's what we do every day. So in the big picture, not much has changed. But the atmospherics are difficult. What do you tell those students? Uh, I tell them that we're going to care for them, that the resources are going to be there to ensure their success, that we're here for them and they need to let us know what they need to feel like they're part of an inclusive community. For students coming in, the ones that you're not speaking with on campus, the ones who are filling out the scholarship applications, the essays, uh, how would you advise them for, for minority students to write those essays? Do you leave in the parts uh, of your culture? Do you take it out? I mean, what do you do? Well, uh, not all of our students write essays. They apply and they submit their materials and then we accept based off their qualifications. So. When you do have a student who's experienced that, it's really about their life story. Mm -hmm. It's about where they came from and their motivation. And that's what we're looking for. If you have grit and determination, you're going to make it here. Speaking of grit and determination, you've had a lot of that here over the last 10 years. What makes you the happiest um, accomplishment-wise as, as you step down as president? Well, okay, I won't pick out a single thing. That's too easy. I mean, we could name the Frisco campus, getting into the American Athletic Conference, becoming Research One. Uh, those are all great. Uh, of course, there's also the fact that we're the fastest growing school in Texas and have been for four years, and we're the third largest school in the state, which just is delightful, okay? Just delightful. 
But the thing that I love the most is that when I got here, I felt that this was a campus that really modeled caring for the students more than any place I'd ever been. We intentionally built that into this culture here. That value permeates UNT. And you hear students and faculty refer to it. When I came here onto campus and I visited, I felt immediately included. I went out to the faculty member and they helped me at that critical moment in my life when I didn't know if I could go on. A staff member showed me the building that I was trying to find the first day of class. That is something that we are really good at. And so building a culture of caring is probably the thing that I feel is the greatest achievement of the team. What surprised you? What did you not expect? Wow. <clears throat> That's a great question. I've been in a lot of higher ed environments, so I've seen a lot before I got here. I think that the fact that people wanted to be close to the administration, that they wanted visible leadership, that they were unafraid to engage, whether it was faculty, staff, or students, was something that was pleasantly surprising. Um, I, I know I can walk across campus now, and not every student knows who I am, but we've narrowed that gap so that people feel we're cared for, so that people recognize that this is a place where the administration is accessible. And so that was a really pleasant surprise because a lot of other places I am have gone to, no one really was too concerned about who leadership was. They just went about their, their day. How do you, what made them concerned about leadership? <clears throat> I think partly it was because there had been huge turnover before I got here. So people wanted to know that there'd be some stability. People wanted to feel that we had a path forward and that it wasn't going to change two years from now. I think I was the sixth president in about a, if you measure it the right way, a 12-year period. Uh, that's pretty disconcerting for a campus. Stability uh, can't be uh, overrated. So when you talk about people, you mean the students, other faculty? Who do you, who do you, who do you mean? Yeah, uh, the, the, the faculty want to know what the administration's doing and they want someone they can trust. Students want to know that they can say, hey, I've got a problem. I get emails literally every day from students saying, I'm having a little trouble. Uh, what, what do I do? And I direct them to the people that can help them with their issues or whatever challenges they're having. I kind of see you as a president of the people. That's a nice way to say it. What is your heartfelt message to the students here on campus? Pursue your dreams and let us help. Stay engaged and we will be there side by side with you to make sure you can achieve your goals. Any parting message or thought? Yes. Um, we've had a great run for 10 years and it's something that makes me feel particularly good uh, because we have built a leadership team here that's really strong. And I would be remiss if I didn't say, uh, when something's failed, it's on me. But when things succeed, it's a team that has done it. And I've been privileged to work with the best team I've ever seen in higher education. That's, that's beautiful. It's true. Oh. I can tell that's personal, very personal to you. What do you want to say to that team? Thank you, thank you for your trust and confidence. Thank you for pulling in the same direction. And thank you for making UNT a household name and a top-ranked university. Most importantly, thank you for modeling caring with everything we do. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm getting a little overclipped. <laughs> They're going to miss you.
I'm going to miss them. I'll be around, you know. I know. It's not the same. I've got some things I haven't been as successful at as others. I really want to try to ramp up innovation and entrepreneurship. You know, I look at the new students coming in the door. They're not interested in going to work for corporate America for 20 years. They are interested in innovating, starting a small business, yes. growing it. Uh, we need to be able to promote that better. It's something I love personally. Uh, I've got plenty of connections. You know, we're working out in Frisco with Plug, plug and Play, and uh, they're the group that started Google, uh, the Frisco Economic Development Corporation. So if I get a, an opportunity, I'm going to work with those students, bring in entrepreneurs, explain intellectual property development, venture capital, and all the rest of it to them. Uh, get them hooked up with teams that can actually not learn about entrepreneurship, but be entrepreneurs. What will that class be called? I don't know. Innovation and Entrepreneurship 101. <laughs> we'll come up with something clever. And I read somewhere <clears throat> that you're a foodie and maybe you'll be teaching the science of food, maybe? Yeah, food, food science would be really fun. We have a growing food studies program. And, and I, the other thing I should tell you is, I'm very proud of this. In my tenure here, we became the number one college food in the country. You gotta love it. Like good food that you're serving on campus? You'd be shocked. Like real food? Like real food. You go to Eagle Landing, it's modeled after, uh, you know, uh, uh, oh, what's it called? Legacy Hall uh, in Plano. Mm -hmm. um, it's phenomenal. It's so good, students don't want to eat anywhere else. We have to make sure the food's equally good everywhere. But the point is, when you serve great food to people, that's a connection. Uh, it's a connection to the campus. Fun fact, when we have a student visit this campus, 85% of those who visit enroll here. Really? Yeah. That's a great fun fact. Isn't it? Why do you think that <coughs> is? <coughs> Two reasons. I asked the kids, and what they say is, I walked onto campus, I felt welcomed. It felt like a place I would be happy. And that matters. And the other reason? The food's really good. <laughs> <laughs> they need to do that in our K through 12 schools. Oh yeah. But I don't know what they serve in K-12. All I know is the food here, the, the students here can go to Eagle Landing and get scratch-made food right in front of their face every day. They can get organic, all of our bakery products, organic, baked here every day. Baked here every day. We don't buy bread. We make bread. All of our greens, uh, no, two-thirds of our greens, grown hydroponically organically. I mean, we do some amazing things. All you, you, under your leadership, was this happening before you got here? No. No, because I remember the stuff I used to eat here. I know. Good old Bruce <laughs> <and> Terry. <laughs> yeah. Um, all the cholesterol you can stand. No, this is different. And we have a, the perennially rated top right vegan restaurant. We've just opened up an allergen-free uh, dining hall. So, Congratulations. Yeah, because stuff. when you eat better, you feel better. And when you feel better, you learn better. It's very simple. Yeah. The food here is so good that 2,500 of our faculty and staff have dining hall passes. All right. Well, let's try it. Okay. <laughs> I'm all for it.